Hey everyone, welcome to 2017. Can you believe it's finally here? As you can see, it's rather chilly where I am, so I've got this huge scarf that looks like it's a Snuggie, cool. Nothing wrong with Snuggies, you know, I would live my life in a Snuggie if I could, which living from home, I'm getting dangerously close. But anyway, 2016 was the longest year ever, and I'm like many of you. I love the idea of a fresh start, new beginnings, you know, I feel renewed and ready and energized to take on my reading this year. That said, <laughs> December was a crazy busy month for me. I thought that I would have all this time to read because we weren't traveling to see family this year, but I kind of forgot to factor in all of the hosting we were gonna do and all of the, um, you know, preparation. We had my family come stay with us for Christmas and then we had some friends from out of town and some more family come for New Year's. It was so fun, I loved it. Um, but I just didn't accomplish all of the reading goals that I set out to in December, and that's fine. Um, I'm just not gonna go and remove myself to go read when people are around. It was a great, restful, lovely holiday, and I hope you had a wonderful holiday as well. Let's go ahead and talk about what I did read in December, and also at the end of this video, I'm going to briefly talk about my top five favorite books of 2016. The top book that I finished in December was Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. I finally finished the Harry Potter series, guys. It's, like, it's done. It was such an emotional experience. If you're new to my channel, I just read Harry Potter, all seven books, for the first time, um, and it was quite an experience. I feel like I have a hole in my heart now. Like, what do I do? I feel a little bit empty. I think it just took me so long to get through them because I was cherishing every word that I read and I didn't want the magic to end. And now that it has, I really, I just don't know. There's just nothing quite like reading Harry Potter. Like, I just wanna stay in that world forever. And I was nervous that reading as an adult, I wouldn't enjoy it, or I just like wouldn't really get what all the fuss was about, but it was just so magical, particularly reading the last book, um, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. I feel like it was especially awesome because I finally got to understand a lot of what I didn't understand about Harry Potter. I feel like I was like, brought into the secrets and like the inside jokes and all of that. I just, it all came together full circle, full picture for me. And I loved it. There's also something satisfying about finishing the last book in a series because I don't do it that often. Like I kind of have commitment issues with series. Even if I enjoy the first book or the second book, I don't always make it to the last book. And so making it to the last book of Harry Potter was such an accomplishment for me. To see this epic, incredible story that's been building for six or seven books just kind of crash into this long, crazy scene with Voldemort and Harry, and everything that goes into preparation before that and everything during, it was just ridiculously good. Like everything ties together so brilliantly um, there's just so much suspense. I'm not gonna give away any spoilers because I do know that there are people out there who haven't read Harry Potter. But that moment when you realize that your perceptions of characters that you thought you knew for the past six books was completely wrong, it's just, oh, hits you right here. Anyway, it was incredible. I will definitely be rereading the series, maybe even annually. Um, but yeah, I loved it. <laughs> I also read Under Rose Tainted Skies in the month of December by Louise Gournal, and I, no surprise, loved this book. I actually did a whole separate spoiler-free review um, in a video, which I'll link down below, so you can check it out if you wanna hear more about it. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. This book was given to me by the publisher in exchange for an honest review. I got this ARC. Um, a few months ago, actually. I honestly think it's such an important read on mental illness. It's just one of those rare books that's uncomfortably real um, in how it depicts mental illness. I had to put it down a few times and not because I didn't enjoy it, but because kind of the opposite. It was just, it was so good and so real. Um, I just felt strangely vulnerable while reading it. I don't know, I feel like I had a lot of fears that it was going to be about um, a boy who saves a girl from her mental illness, but that is so not what this book is about. The author, Louise Gornall, um, writes from the perspective of Nora, who has agoraphobia, OCD, and anxiety. 
Um, and I think the reason it's so authentic is because Louise Gornall um, has agoraphobia herself. So this is really an own voices book. It's extremely eye-opening, um, even for people who seem to know a lot about mental illness. I just feel like I learned a lot um, about how crippling mental illness can be for some people and how some individuals don't feel brave or stronger than their mental illness, but they learn to grow and they are strong and they are brave. There's a resiliency to it. The character doesn't know that she's brave, um, but then she grows into that understanding and it's really a story of hope without being dismissive of what that recovery process is like. Plus the love story in here was super cute and awkward and exactly what I feel like a high school relationship would be between two pretty innocent um, teenagers. I loved it. I also read A World Without You by Beth Revis and this is another book on mental illness. Guys, December was a heavy month. This book definitely blindsided me. I feel like I should have known what it was about because I got it in my quarterly box. Um, but I don't know, I just, it kind of missed that it was about mental illness. I feel like if I had known that, I probably wouldn't have read it around the same time I read Under Rose Tainted Skies because it was just so heavy. But I'm so glad I read this book. I read this book with what I would say was the perfect amount of knowledge going into it, which is to say not a lot. There was a lot of shock value for me. I don't know, I just, I found it so moving to the point where I actually tweeted the author the night that I finished this book and engaged back and forth on Twitter with her. And really just, you know, for some personal reasons, this book just gutted me. I'm forever thankful for this book because I feel like it really strips the reader of that stigma of mental illness um, and allows you to see kind of from the inside out um, what living with mental illness is like. And not only that, but you get to see how it plays out um, with different family dynamics, which was super interesting. I actually wrote an entire spoiler-free blog post um, at mollyreads.com, which you can read about. I kind of go into more detail about my thoughts on this book. And you can also find <laughs> um, my vlog where I basically talk as I'm reading the book, although I don't know how discernible any of that was because I was very emotional. Um, but yeah, so you can go find that. I'll link that down below. I also read five of the seven of Chronicles of Narnia. Um, and if you have been watching or following my Instagram at Molly Reads, you'll see that I've posted a lot of pictures and quotes um, from just my reading experience. It's also hashtag Molly Reads Narnia. Um, and that's been a really fun time. I still have The Silver Chair and The Last Battle left. Um, and I'm probably not going to go into detail here about what I've read so far. I think I want to wait until I finish the series and then do a blog post or something. But I mean, it's no secret that I love the this series. The Magician's Nephew is just a poetic, lovely, inspiring, magical creation narrative. Um, and I just loved the whole thing. Um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is obviously perfect. I mean, so good. And I actually watched the movie after I read this one, which is not quite as good as the books, but still really fun. There's just so much rich symbolism. If you're reading these as a Christian, I feel like it gives you um, this new lens to view the gospel, which I really appreciate, especially reading as an adult. Um, that said, I do think that anyone could enjoy this series, even if you're not a Christian. So I would definitely encourage everyone to read it. But um, for me personally, reading it around Christmas was such an awesome experience. But yeah, the um, the horse and his boy was really fun to read because I didn't remember it as well as the other books for some reason. So it was kind of like reading it for the first time and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I think that my favorite book will forever be Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, there's just, it's just so good. Like the undragoning of Eustace uh, Scrub. It's, it's an image that I take with me a lot, strangely, in my everyday life. It's just something that stuck with me and holds a lot of meaning to me. Um, and I, yeah, I love it. So yeah, I just have these two left, which I'll probably finish in January. Um, but I'm kind of glad that I didn't finish them in December because then I would have finished Chronicles of Narnia and Harry Potter at the same time, and that would have been 
just too much, guys, too much. So that's what I read in the month of December, and now I wanna get to my top five favorite books of 2016. My top favorite book of the year is probably The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon. You guys know that I love this book. I rave about it all the time. I actually have two copies of this book and just lent a copy to my friend and she's reading it right now and texting me like all the time about how much she loves it. And it's just so heartwarming because I'm sharing the love of this book. I can't describe to you how much I love this book and just how unexpected it was. Um, it's just a masterpiece. Like the writing is incredible. It's compelling, suspenseful, super dark, atmospheric, and it's just really unique storytelling, especially the second half of the novel. It's a gothic historical fiction thriller set in Barcelona in 1945, and the main character is a boy named Daniel, whose father is an antiquarian um, book dealer, and he, Daniel finds himself at this place called the Cemetery of Forgotten Books, and there he discovers an author's work, Julian Carax, he falls in love with this book and it's very mesmerizing. Every book by that author is disappearing or being destroyed. And that's kind of where the book really kicks off. It's full of secrets and murder and madness and loss and love. It's just so good. Everything you could ever want in a story. Definitely read this if you haven't yet. It's great. I also loved Sweet Bitter by Stephanie Dandler. I did a separate book review for this book, um, which I'll link down below. This is honestly, some of the most beautiful prose I've ever read. I found myself rereading sentences over and over because it was just so lovely. Um, there's just so many intimate details and descriptions. It's a coming of age novel. The main character is 22. It's about New York City. It's about the restaurant culture, foodie culture. Um, and it's just so good. I will say people tend to love or hate this book. Um, and I can kind of see why you wouldn't like it if you're more of a plot-driven reader. And also, if you don't like reading certain intense scenes, there's a lot of vulgar language in here. Um, I mean, you can't really talk about restaurant culture in New York City without talking about some of those toxic relationships and drugs and things like that. Um, so yeah, I can understand why this wouldn't be a book for everyone. Um, but if you like coming of age novels about New York City and you like beautiful writing and you can appreciate a book for beautiful writing, then I think you might want to give this a shot. I, I just, I almost loved the book for how vulgar it was. That sounds weird. I guess the grit, the grit of the book. That's what I was looking for and that's what sets it apart. I also picked for a favorite book, Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. This book came out this year. Um, towards the end of the year, and it was just so fun and trippy. Like super genre bending, sci-fi slash thriller slash quantum physics. Actually, a lot of the quantum physics stuff kind of went over my head, but that's okay. In fact, I think that kind of helped make it more authentic in a way. Um, it really just felt so believable. Jason, the main character, teaches physics at a local college um, and he gets abducted one day and when he wakes up his wife is not his wife, his son is not his son, he's living a completely different life. And that's all you need to know. Honestly, that's all you need to know. Don't look it up because you might find spoilers. Also, the suspense toward the end of the book literally gave me a stomach ache. Like it was that kind of a just one more chapter kind of book. In my mind, this was the perfect thriller. Another book I loved in 2016 was All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. I was late to jump on the bandwagon for this one, but I'm so glad I did. I actually listened to this book on Audible um, and I'm so glad I did because it just, it kind of helped with pacing and pronunciation of French and German names. It made it feel more like I was in the story. It's just one of those stunning, beautiful historical fiction World War II books um, that really just sticks with you forever. There were just so many rich details and Mari Lore was one of my favorite female characters. This is about a blind French girl and a German boy whose lives um, kind of cross paths um, in occupied France. You see the ugly parts of humanity alongside the beautiful, resilient parts of humanity. It's just cut you in the heart kind of good, you know? Um, but I would say don't read it unless you're prepared for a good cry because it's emotional. I do kind of wonder what I would have thought of the book if I had physically read it instead of listened to it on audio because 
I think I remember hearing that it was kind of slow for some readers in the beginning. I mean, I would encourage um, readers who maybe put it down because they couldn't get through it to try it on audio because I absolutely loved it. The narrator was awesome. And last but not least is The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. Some of you know that I've gotten into Neil Gaiman this year and he is one of my favorite authors now. I've said this before, but this book is childhood. Um, and I actually listened to this one on audio too. Um, and it was narrated by Neil Gaiman himself and he has just the best storytelling voice. The protagonist is a middle-aged man who returns home for a funeral and kind of rediscovers his childhood home. And he starts to remember, um, particularly remembers stories about a girl named Letty Hempstock and her mother and her grandmother. This is magical realism. And honestly, that's all you need to know going into it. It's just, there's so many beautiful quotes. Um, and it's not a children's book. I think some people think it's a book for kids. It's actually quite terrifying. Um, I mean, I think that some kids could read it, but the heart of the story is that childlike childhood innocence, but it's really a great book for adults to read and it's pretty, pretty dark. So those are my top five favorite books of 2016. Let me know down below what your favorite books were, what you read in the month of December. Anyway, I hope you're having a great start to the new year. I hope your first month of reading goes well. The cat's chewing on a light bulb right now. Anyway, I've been watching all of the reading resolution videos that you guys put out and it's so um, inspiring and encouraging. I don't think I'll be making a resolutions video. Maybe I will. I don't really have any solid resolutions right now. I'm just trying to keep reading, you know? That's the main goal. And don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you later. Bye.